Frankly speaking, I did not plan to make a video about Istanbul. There are so many made already that it seems pointless to compete on this stage. But when I looked at other videos, I was really surprised to find that they all mainly concentrate on the standard tourist attractions. Like the Sea of Marmara, sometimes with the Princess Island, the Basilica system, Dalma Bahçe and so on. Some people even manage to forget about Hagia Sophia somehow. And of course, these are the iconic places. If you're new to Istanbul, they are a must-go and a must-see. But there's another big attraction of the city that has been completely forgotten. Or at least, concerning the size, it's certainly the biggest of all. And as a boy, I'm particularly interested in it and feel it's kind of a shame that everyone forgets about it. So, if you're tired of walking between ISFV and the Basilica system, then I suggest we walk through a slightly different Istanbul, along its ancient ramparts, from the Sea of Mamre to the Golden Horn, and see what's around there. Perhaps we should talk a little bit about the history. But don't worry just a little bit so that it doesn't get boring. Otherwise, it's sometimes very unclear what kind of antiquity have these stones seen at all. The city, which stood at the site of today's Istanbul, has always been very well economically located. Firstly, right on the way from the Vaganians to the Greeks, and secondly, controlling entry and exit to the Black Sea, in general has always been a very profitable occupation. This is why, understandably, there have always been plenty of pretenders to the city, from the Persians and Spartans to the Huns and Slavs. We don't really know anything about the very first walls. It is clear that the city was somehow protected, and the Spartans and later Septimius Severus have built something, some kind of walls to protect it. But the first well-described walls were built by the legendary Emperor Constantine, after whom the city was once named, and this was around 330 AD. But these walls are not really interesting, because there's not much left of them, and they were about a mile and a half away from the ones I'm going to walk along. The existing walls were finished in 413, under the direction of the Prefect Antimius. The construction was so important at the time, that some sources refer to Antimius as the second founder of Constantinople. I'm obviously not the one to judge, but he certainly left a monument of himself for the ages. That said, the further fate of the walls is similar to a swing. They were destroyed, restored, demolished, rebuilt and reconstructed over and over again. And if it was always people who were rebuilding the wall, there was even a post called the Count of the Walls, who was responsible for their condition. Then ruining them were both the sieges and the nature. Unfortunately, earthquakes like the latest one so far in February 2023 have happened many times before. A little later than the completion of the land walls, I think in the middle of about the 5th century AD, the sea walls were also built. One of the reasons for that is that shortly before, in 439, the Vandals have captured Carthage, and the local fleet has become military, or even pirate, and terrorized the Mediterranean from the water. But the sea walls were originally simpler and are now in a much worse state of preservation, so I will go along the land ones. They are, however, not in the best of condition either, although it might be said that they are being restored as well. The land walls are about 6 kilometers long, but some of the signposts say 7,620 meters, and I actually find that accuracy very disconcerting. But whatever the case, it's a very impressive construction, even for Constantinople, which at one point was known to be the largest city in the world. I will follow the walls from south to north, from the Marmara Sea to the Golden Horn. Firstly, because it was easier for me to get there this way, and secondly, because there, at the Golden Horn, I also wanted to see a few more interesting places. 
some of which unfortunately have been closed. But more on that later. Logically, the wall should start right next to the sea. And indeed, in fact, this was historically the case. But if you look at the contemporary video, you can see that there's still quite a lot of room. And no, it's not because the walls have been moved as it may seem. Quite the opposite, the sea has been moved. The fact is that in 1959, the Turks made an embankment to host this road. And in fact, it has moved the sea away from the walls. If you finally go along the wall, it quickly falls back on the so-called Yedikule. The Seven Towers Fortress, built in 1458 by Sultan Mehmed the Conqueror, who in fact captured Constantinople after a famous siege five years earlier. The siege which in turn put an end to the Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantium. The fortress is built on the foundations of the four pre-existing towers of the wall, to which Mehmed, in fact, added three more and simply closed the perimeter. That said, the fortress itself is rather strange. It is constantly under renovation and they ask you for money to get in and on the wall. By the way, a little further you can climb the walls for free and I'll be sure to show it, just bear with me. But there's another reason why Yedikule is well worth popping into after all and that's not walls or towers. This is the place where the Golden Gate is located the former main entrance to the city, and the prototype of the Golden Gate in Kyiv and later the one in Vladimir and even in San Francisco. The gate was indeed used for ceremonial entrance to Constantinople. However, the last one to use it was Mikhail Palaiologos in 1261. But before that, it was really a gate of absolutely spectacular beauty with bas reliefs and statues, for example, the Sibel's Line Chariot, similar to the one I showed on my walk around Madrid. But even now, from the outside, the gate looks quite impressive. But now, alas, there's very little of that beauty left. The form entrance to the town overlooks the cemetery, there are no decorations and the polished metal panels that gave the gate its name have fallen into oblivion. After the city was captured by the Ottomans, the Golden Gate was laid out. According to one version, this was done to prevent the arches and wall from collapsing. And this is actually true, because they were actually laid before the city was taken. But on the other hand, there is a beautiful legend that it was through this gate that a Christian monarch would enter to reclaim Constantinople. Just like Jerusalem, they have also walled up a golden gate there just in case. Although it has to be said that the reason there is a little bit more serious. The Messiah is to enter Jerusalem through the golden gate there. But regardless of the gates, the fortress itself has been restored in a slightly strange way. It is customary in reconstruction to leave the boundary between the original and the restored part visible. But here, the restored pieces are somehow too conspicuous. To be honest, even a derelict one like this part of the walls looks much nicer. Overall, the wall is being restored. But really, somehow it's quite chunky and frankly, it feels like it's of various quality. The restored Belgrade Gate, also known as Kselokserkis Gate, looks like a brand new one. But in reality, of course, it's a real fortress gate, which was probably given its name after the prisoners and settlers from the capture of Belgrade by Suleiman the Magnificent were placed behind them. This gate, by the way, continues the tradition of being bricked up just in case something goes wrong. According to the legend, it was through this gate that Frederick Barbarossa was to enter Constantinople. So what? Exactly, you got it. And this is how they stood for a century and a half until 1346, when they were briefly opened, but again, a hundred years later, they were closed again, this time until 1886. Is anyone still surprised that the Ottomans called this gate Karalikapi, the closed gate? Here is also a great place to see how the wall is set up. 
Actually, before coming here, I had no idea myself what kind of engineering structure it is. In its best years, it looked something like this. In fact, it's not just one wall, but three separate walls. The inner one is the tallest and the thickest. It's about 12 meters high, 5 to 6 meters thick, and has broken bricks and lime mortar inside. There are 96 towers on the outside of it. They're mostly square, but there are also six and eight corner ones, and even one pentagonal for some reason. The towers are 15 to 20 meters high and stand quite unevenly, depending on the topography. The tower usually had two floors, not connected to each other. The lower one was open to the city and was used as a warehouse, and the top floor and the roof were used for defense and were only accessible from the wall. The outer wall of the towers also had small doors for accessing the next wall. It is lower than the inner one, only about 8 meters with a passageway along it and another row of towers on the outside. A total of 62 have survived and there are no frills there. They are all square or semicircular, about 13 meters high. But even such a reduced wall was at the time a very serious defense. With the shortage of soldiers in the 15th century, the Byzantines defended this part and the city held out at the time. There was also a moat in front of the outer wall. Contrary to the expectations, historians cannot say for sure whether it was ever filled with water. But even an empty 20-meter ditch, about 10 meters deep, was a pretty serious obstacle. Inside the ditch, there were walls tapered towards the top so that they cannot be used as a bridge. And there was also a small wall on the inside of the moat, about a meter and a half high, but which also had to be somehow surmounted. So, no, it's not really surprising that a garrison of just several thousand soldiers could successfully defend the city against tens of thousands of attackers. Horizontal brick strips are not a tribute to aesthetics, but it's not a military necessity either. This is a kind of an ancient protection against earthquakes. These parts are slightly softer and dampen the shocks. But I have to admit that even these tricks on the whole did not help much. The first earthquake damaged the walls back in 447, but the 57 towers were rebuilt in a record time of just 60 days, mainly because of the fears of the attack from the Huns led by the famous Attila. Then there were more earthquakes and Arab sieges in the 7th and 8th centuries after which the Slavs approached, Bulgars in the 813 and three Russian sieges from 860 to 941, although with varying success. Then the walls suffered more sieges. The Crusaders in the late 11th and a few times in the 13th century until the Nicaeans took Constantinople at the third attempt in 1261. The last war damage occurred in the 14th and the 15th centuries, when the Ottomans first sieged Constantinople several times without success, and then in 1453, after the most famous siege, the city was finally captured. Since then, the walls have suffered mainly from the earthquakes. 49 towers suffered during the so-called Little Doom Day in 1509 and were restored by Sultan Bayezid, and then in 1635 and restored by Grand Vizier Bayram Pasha, and then in 1640-41 and restored incidentally only six years later by Sultan Ibrahim. And then there was a long period when the walls fell apart little by little because the Turks were in general not interested in them at all. Although in the 1930s, architects Alfred Agash and Henri Prost devised a plan to reconstruct the walls. But it wasn't until 1985 that UNESCO included the walls into the World Heritage List and the restoration works have finally begun. The first attempts at restoration were actually a failure. They were criticized even back then for destroying historical fragments for poor materials and bad quality and all this was fully confirmed during the 1999 earthquake, when the reconstructed sections collapsed and the historic ones stood firm. By this point, I had reached the Silivri Gate between 34th and 36th Towers. They're also called the Peggy Gate, and these are probably the same gates which are referred to as the Holy Spring Gate, because one of the towers has an epitaph on it, to one Manuel Vrenius Leantarsis, 
was said to restore the Holy Spring Gates in 1438. Near the gates outside the town, there indeed was the Balaclia Monastery with a spring next to it. The Silivri name of the gate is after the province outside and the quarter inside the city where in Byzantine times imperial weddings were held. In general, as you can see, gate attribution is a bit cryptic and ambiguous. Firstly, even originally, there were two types of the gates, civilian and military. Civilian gates were used for the day-to-day -day life of the city, entering, leaving, bringing in goods and everything else. These gates had names. I had already seen the Golden Gate, the Belgrade Gate, this one is the Silivri Gate, and there will be many more. The military gates had no names. These were distinguished by numbers and were used during sieges for sorties and sabotage. But, well, the story is always the same. The gates changed purpose, were rebuilt, laid down, and new gates were cut through. There is nothing left of some of them, I will tell you about this later when I get to the final assault on Constantinople. So now, it is not always possible, even for the professionals, to attribute the gates exactly. As for the Silivri gate, though, these are known to be the gates, through which the main Nikia forces entered Constantinople in 1261. They weren't actually going to take the city at the time, but when they met the Greeks nearby who said that the main forces of the Latins had gone on an expedition and that only a small force remained in the city, the Nicaeans could obviously not resist such a temptation. The Greeks also showed them a secret passage into the city, perhaps one of the military gates or a wicket of some sort, and the Nicaeans certainly could not pass up such a chance and several warriors entered through that secret passage, opened the gates of Silivri and let in the main forces, taking the defenders completely by surprise. In the end, the city was taken by a force of only 900 men, and some sources even speak of just 600 warriors altogether. The Latins, of course, were very upset and were immediately about to storm the city back. But then, Nikian Caesar Alexis Strategopoulos disguised the locals as warriors, showed them on the walls and thus created the impression of a large army defending the city. The Latins, fearing a defeat, did not risk an attack and left. And ironically, the loss of Constantinople then meant the end of the Latin Empire. And if you imagine that it happened in general, almost by an accident, and with such small forces, then it is probably the biggest bad luck and the smallest forces that had ever ruined empires. And if you think that we now know all about the Silivri Gate, then, well, we still don't. In the 1998 alone, for example, cellars with the bus reliefs and tombs from the 4th to 5th century were discovered underneath. But even that is not all. The Silivri Gates can be climbed onto, and it's free just as I promised. Let's go. To do this, you have to go through the first external archway and turn left into a narrow passage. There is a small courtyard there, I will talk about it a little later, and a staircase to the top. And here I am, standing on the outer wall, on the passageway which the defenders used to move around safely. The arches on the right are not through, so it is relatively safe to walk. But safety is not our choice, we need to get up there, to that very top where the shots were fired. Oh, and note by the way, the Turkish safety procedures, no handrails, no railings, nothing at all. To the right goes the castle wall and I go left up the tower. And here it is again, the wall structure which I have shown you before. And this is how the defenders looked at those who approached the gates. But even that is not all. Generally speaking, the Silivri gates proved to be one of the most interesting and perhaps the richest in surprises. Remember I promised to tell you about the courtyard? It is called the Parable, and there is something unexpected there. For some reason, this small building is not much mentioned and seems forgotten even in comparison with the walls, which are a little lost on their own on the overall grandeur of Istanbul. But this is a Byzantine tomb dating back to the 4th or 5th century AD. It is thought to be a family burial ground, 
but no precise attribution has yet been made. It is called hippogeum here, but to be honest, that's a bit odd, because generally speaking, a hippogeum is an underground burial. But, alright, I'll leave that to the Turks. What matters to me is that it's a 1500-year-old structure, which not only you can look from the outside, and completely free of course, but you can also go inside. And if a few years ago the tomb was in a terrible state, I think this was almost like homeless people were sleeping there. It has now been cleaned up. The most valuable things were taken out of there though. The original side lids of the sarcophagus are now preserved in the Istanbul Archaeological Museum, and there are copies installed on site, and sadly, very inaccurate ones. As you can see, the original sarcophagi have been painted, and the copies not only don't have a single drop of paint on them, but they have even forgotten the recesses. The carvings are classically biblical. Moses with the Ten Commandments, Abraham sacrificing Isaac, and a picture of the emperor's family. The four side sarcophagi are of sandstone, and these are the copies. But the central one is marble, and it's original. Once there were frescoes on the walls and ceiling, but the homeless people who lived here and the time have left basically nothing of them. From there, the restoration of the walls somehow came to a halt. And there you can clearly see what is becoming of the walls if they're not cared for. But the next gate, again with many names, has been restored very well. This is the so-called Mevlani Gate by the Mevlevi Dervish Monastery nearby. Or the gates of the region because of the road from them that led to an area called the region. They are also the gates of Polyandrian, that is many people. And it's quite funny here, such a black humor in a sense, because it's probably because of the proximity to the cemetery. Or they also called the Red Gate, one of the two major parties in Roman Constantinople. Suddenly the second party was white. But it seems that the most correct name for them is the Rhesus Gate, after the Byzantine general, although I could not find out what he was famous for. However, it is one of the best preserved gates, dating back to the reign of Theodosius II. There is a Christian cross on the beam that supports the arch of the outer gate, and an inscription that it was renewed under Justinian and Sophia by a certain Narcissus and Stephan. That is what I call people making history. An inscription from 447 AD can be seen on the left hand block under the beam. It says, by order of Theodosius, Constantine erected these strong walls in less than two months. Even Pallada could not have built such a mighty fortress so quickly. While these gates in general are famous for a large number of inscriptions, it is true that not all of them can be read, but it's interesting all the same. And you can also see an additional way of the wall protection. If you stand between the inner and outer portals, you can see that this is a closed square. And even if the outer gate is taken, the attackers would not go far at once, finding themselves in a kind of a stone sack with no protection. These gates, as well as many others, are still used by ordinary traffic today. And this traffic is regulated by some totally weird-looking chaps, whose status I still don't understand. But their throne is truly royal. On the outside of the gate, there is a museum and a panorama of the 1453 siege. It is very popular with Turks, but I honestly didn't go there because I was more interested in real history, not a museum one. From the Peribol near the Rizios gate, you can climb the wall again and see the place where the city gates were once installed. And then, even get inside the tower. From here, you can clearly see how the space of the terrace between the walls is used, and over the backfield moat as well. Oh yes, these are the gardens. Vegetables, herbs, tomatoes, all that, right in Istanbul. And all this, of course, is immediately up for sale. There is now a breach in the wall in the lowland area where the former Lycus River used to be. The first total destruction of the wall happened here quite a while ago, 
because it was the weakest point of the city projection, and it was probably here where the Ottomans breached the walls and entered the city. A wide avenue can be crossed by a subway and to continue along the wall you have to go around the dark grey building and upstairs. There will be a rather sleek garden that leads to one of the main tourist gates of the wall, St. Roman Gate. They're also called Topkapi or the Gun Gate, but this is not quite right, because the real St. Roman's Gate was down there where the road now runs. It was there where the main forces of the attackers and defenders were positioned. It was also there where Urban's huge cannon was installed, firing cannonballs just under a meter in diameter at a distance of two kilometers. That's one hell of a machine, especially for those days. The gun crew of almost a thousand men, reloading in an hour. But the truth is, once you get it, that's the end. It was probably her shot on the 29th of May 1453 that helped to make a huge breach in the wall of Constantinople, which among other things allowed the Ottomans to capture the city. The cannon actually started cracking on the second day of use, and after a month and a half it fell apart altogether. But the goal has already been achieved. All in all, it seems that it is the presence of the artillery that enabled the Ottomans to finally capture Constantinople. For the first time using cannons en masse, the cannons were grouped together with small cannons and catapults supporting the big one. And also by organizing the production and supply of the cannonballs, Mehmed II was finally able to breach the walls. And all this despite the fact that the cannons were actually quite flawed. There were no carriages at all. They were simply carted around and Urban's cannon was dragged by as many as 30 bulls. Then one of the ends of the cannon was placed in the ground and the other on a special wooden stand for which the same basilica required about 200 men. The cannon was protected from enemy fire by a shield that needed to be retracted before firing. And despite all this, the power by this point was such that when the cannonball hit the walls they collapsed and the towers were penetrated all the way through. Of the walls and gates understandably little remained in the end. So now tourists are told that everything happened nearby on a hill, although why would one go at it from a military point of view is not clear. But whatever the case, these walls were certainly witness to perhaps the most fierce battle of all, in which the Byzantine Empire finally fell. Further along the wall, converted into a parking fence, is the legendary 5th military gate. You do remember, don't you, that the civil gates had names and the military had numbers. The gate is badly damaged, as it is also in a relatively weaker part of the wall, and there was definitely fighting for the city here. The Ottomans also called this gate the Assault Gate, because according to one version, it was here that the first Ottoman breakthrough into the city took place. If so, it was here where the last Christian ruler of Constantinople, the Byzantine Emperor Constantine XI Palaeologus, died in battle. On hearing of the Ottomans' breakthrough, he rushed into a battle, saying, The city has fallen, I have nothing more to live for. He took off all the insignia of imperial dignity except for the purple boots, by which he was later identified. This, of course, is only one, albeit the main version of Constantine's death, because there's no reliable evidence of this. All those involved in this battle were killed, and stories are only based on the testimonies of others who were in other parts of the defense. According to the Ottoman version, the emperor died in disgrace which is very unlikely given his past military training. Or even run away, which is not confirmed at all, and there is no sign of him appearing anywhere later. In fact, Constantine's death is confirmed even by the Turks themselves, who mention that the emperor's head was carried through conquered Constantinople, and then placed onto a column from which it mysteriously disappeared. But the emperor's tomb is definitely not found yet. It has been searched since 1503, but by today there are only a few versions of where Constantine is buried, 
but none of them has been confirmed yet. Near a gate inside the city, suddenly there is an Armenian monastery and a couple of Turkish girls taking photos in front of its gate. Behind the 5th military gate, there is Sulukule, an old gypsy neighborhood of Istanbul. In the past, houses used to stand right up against the walls, but those who didn't get any accommodation simply pitched their tents. It was one of Istanbul's unsafe neighborhoods, but now it seems to have been rebuilt and ennobled, and in fact it looks quite decent now, although the fences are still covered with barbed wire, and I wonder, what's it like to live here? The last gate I reached was the second most important gate of Constantinople after the Golden Gate. This is the so-called Carisius Gate by a monastery nearby. They're also called sometimes the Gates of Edirne or Andrianople because of the road from them that led to this province. And also sometimes for some reason St. John's Gate, but I have not been able to find any explanation for that. Maybe there was a bus relief on the wall or maybe there was a church of some kind nearby. Importantly, it is the highest gate in the city in terms of the height above the sea level, and the sultans used it as a ceremonial gate to replace the Golden Gate, which has been walled up. It was through this gate that they set out on their campaigns, and through them they triumphantly returned. This tradition was started by the first Ottoman ruler of Constantinople, Sultan Mehmed the Conqueror, who entered freshly captured city here, as evidenced by a rather modest for such an event marble plaque. I was honestly already a bit tired here from the militaristic stone history and decided to not go to Blakerna. Yes, there are remains of the Emperor Palace there, but by this point the walls and towers had begun to merge into one indistinct tangle, and I decided to move on to the next point, which in all my visits to Istanbul I have never visited. This is the Byzantine Church of Christ the Savior from the Monastery Ensemble in Kora. But, and this is the biggest disappointment of this walk, it is closed. Not only it has been converted into a mosque, but it is also fully closed. Although it looks like a restoration in general, I should say that from my relatively little Istanbul experience, it seems that the Islamization of the city is proceeding rather quickly. As sad as it is to admit it, if you want to see the pre-Ottoman Istanbul, especially some ex-religious Christian places, then perhaps you should hurry up. I have a feeling that these will soon be less and less available. But meanwhile, I was just walking and looking at the surrounding Istanbul. Wooden in places, not very touristy, living its own life. Here is a man who forgot something at home and in order to not go upstairs, his missus gave it to him right out of the window and it's not the first and it seems not the last time to happen. It is always great to see the living city. Here is a staircase that somehow reminds me of Montmartre, but with such an Istanbul flavor. And here is an auction going on right in the middle of the street, and in case anyone is wondering, yes, this rug has been sold. In the meantime, I realized that I ended up with a walk through non-Muslim Istanbul. Byzantine walls, Armenian monastery, Christian church. So, you could say I wasn't even too surprised to see a synagogue. I did not go inside though. I don't know what the rules are and whether you can just walk in from the street. But I decided to pour some tea over the frustration of the closed monastery of Kora and thought that since there were already Byzantines, Jews and Armenians, Maybe now it is time to visit the Greeks? Fana is Greek and at the same time Jewish part of Istanbul. Located deep inside Constantinople, it was not looted, probably because it did not put up any resistance, although the Turkish sources say it's quite the other way around, as a reward for bravery during the siege. Whatever the reason, Mehmed II granted the area some special rights, and the Christian patriarch of Constantinople lived here. And then, of course, the rich non-Muslims around him, mostly Greeks and Jews. They built these conspicuous two or three-story houses where the top floor was for living and the lower floor was where the service space. 
and this is exactly the opposite of the northern Hanseatic houses I showed you in Riga. The residents of the area were called Fanariots. Despite their proximity to the Patriarch, they mostly did not choose a religious career, but rather a career in commerce and jewellery and thanks to their education and language skills diplomatic work. In the mid-18th century, the Fana district heyday came to an end. It was by this point that the rich and noble families have moved from here to other areas, mainly to their own villas built on the banks of the Bosphorus. By this point it was getting quite dark, and I was nearly on my way home, but I suddenly stumbled upon an amazing Atali or Han Pamuk Istanbul, at least the way I imagined it to be. It is so lively, so nonchalant, where old people sit in the streets and children know all their friends from 20 houses to the right and to the left. The twilight may have also played a part, but I found it so very cozy. At the very end, when it was already completely dark, I finally made my way down to the Golden Horn. After all, it was necessary to finish the journey that had begun at the Sea of Marmara, at the other water. It was quite dark, I was sitting on the warm stones of the pier and I thought that Istanbul is so rich in history after all, that those visiting it for the very first time should probably start with the classics. With Aya Sophia, Topkapi, Galata, Cisterns, there are several, by the way, don't get hung up on Basilica only. But if you have already been there, then the wall and its surroundings, which saw the heyday and were mute witnesses to the greatest tragedy of all, the fall of the two empires, the Byzantine and the Latin, is definitely worth spending some time and efforts on. And to you, who have now watched this video through to the very end, a huge thank you for the company on this walk around Istanbul. And see you in Ankara.